Dan Epstein is an instructional designer in Chicago. It's a job that involves writing instructional manuals and making training videos for different industries. It's a career he's had since his mid-20s. I ended up getting jobs on these crews that were shooting videos for corporate training projects. But I happened to be standing near uh, someone who was working on a computer-based training course for the Army Infantry School. She was having trouble identifying two types of Russian tank, and I pointed out the differences, and so suddenly I became the subject matter expert for that course. Then I learned instructional design. College students come to me all the time, worrying about their careers, and I tell them that most people end up in careers just like Dan did. You stumble into something you didn't know anything about, and you start making good money, and then you stick it out. I don't know whether it's reassuring or depressing, because when you do stick out a career for the money or familiarity, you might end up worrying about what might have been. This is true of Dan. He didn't come out of college aiming to be an instructional designer. He had more exciting goals. I enlisted as an interrogator. Went to basic training. After basic training, I ended up at Fort Bragg at an outfit called the 4th Psychological Operations Group. The first thing they told us was, everybody breaks. I was put on a project that took me down to Panama, to Central America. Elsewhere, the Reagan administration, which has been trying to drive the Panamanian military dictator General Noriega out of office. Which is about as much as I can say about that, because all that stuff is classified. For Dan, the alternative path was military and government intelligence. He could have been on the inside of U.S. foreign policy for the past 30 years. He only left because, well, you're kind of dumb in your early 20s. Nothing I've done since then really compares in its kind of intensity, importance, effect, and just the the craziness of it. Now, toward the end of his career, Dan picked up a book by the former intelligence official Richard Clark, who worked for every president from Reagan through George W. Bush. And he started thinking about this alternative life of his. I could imagine in my other life, where I'd gone after my desired future career in intelligence, as somebody working for Richard Clark, like being a member of his staff. What was more interesting is, as I read the book and thought about myself in this alternate universe, was, God, would I be sitting down with my boss, Richard Clark, in this in the universe next door, and we'd look at each other and say, we failed. It's easy to think of your alternative life as the one you regret not having or as the one you're grateful you didn't have. But what's more interesting is if you end up being ambivalent about both lives. You know, on the one hand, it's like, yeah, I could have had this interesting career uh, in this alternate universe as a a staffer for Richard Clark, but the way it ended up in reality for him, it would have been like, well, I guess this didn't really amount to much, now did it? You're listening to High Fi Nation, a show about philosophy, that turns stories into ideas. I'm Barry Lamb. Today's show, The Ashes of Truth. Our story today is about an alternative path and how sometimes you think back to a moment in your life when things could have gone another way and you just can't let it go. If only I could do it all over again. Uh, I could have taken... Perhaps a different course. It's the story of two men who crossed paths in 1971 and despised each other. Hi, I'm I'm Errol Morris. I'm a filmmaker, kind of. Errol Morris is the Oscar award-winning filmmaker of The Fog of War. He's also the maker of The Gates of Heaven, The Thin Blue Line, Tabloid, The Unknown Knowns, and a host of other films, television movies, and commercials. He's considered by critics and other filmmakers as one of the most influential documentary filmmakers of his generation. But he didn't start in film. He started in philosophy. Ending up with Kuhn, I believe, was one of my great misfortunes. The other man in this story is Thomas Kuhn. Paradigm. 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 One of the most influential philosophers of the 20th century. I see him as a fraud. Dogmatic, inflexible, and abusive. Thomas Kuhn's 1962 book, 
the structure of scientific revolutions, is by far the best-selling and most cited book in academic philosophy of the past 100 years. It introduced the world to the term paradigm shift. He would assault people. Errol Morris crossed paths with Thomas Kuhn in the early 70s at Princeton University in the PhD program in the History and Philosophy of Science. 45 years later, Errol is completing a work in philosophy he didn't get a chance to finish long ago. An extended refutation of Thomas Kuhn. The book tortures me. It really does completely torture me. I can't even really understand why I've written it. There's so many pieces to Kuhn's nonsense. It's fun to go through them bit by bit by bit by bit. It's this other life that Errol Morris leads. The life of a philosopher concerned with truth and realism that we talked about in our time together. It's an alternative path marked by maybe even a rising out of an utter contempt for Thomas Kuhn that he's held for all this time. Let's go back to 1971. The city, the university, the country, and the philosophy that set the stage for the two paths for Errol Morris. I'm Jim Challey. I'm a senior lecturer emeritus in the Department of Physics and in Science, Technology, and Society. Jim Challey is a colleague of mine at Vassar who studied under Thomas Kuhn in the same program as Errol during the same period. Jim was drafted into Vietnam and had to leave the program early. So he and Errol only overlapped for a semester, and they didn't know each other. The graduate students lived in a graduate college. At 6 o'clock, we put on black robes and walked into this incredibly gothic dining hall. The master of the graduate college would give a prayer in Latin, pro quibo ac poto omnibus, and we would say amen and sit down and then be served by undergraduates. Uh, would bring these platters uh, to each, each table. At the same time, 20 miles away, parts of Newark are burning down. So it was just this mind warp. I had come out of the University of Wisconsin in the 60s, and this was a time of incredible unrest, student demonstrations, police violence, demonstrations that I was part of and was arrested for. I was arrested in Princeton for demonstrating against the Institute for Defense Analysis. I came to Princeton having read a lot of history and philosophy of science, but I felt in general quite isolated. It wasn't clear that the things that interested me interested anybody else. The students seemed to be really bad. They seemed to not be particularly interested in anything. Philosophy, even though it was called the program and the history and philosophy of science at Princeton, there was no philosophy. Kuhn kept it that way. I didn't realize it at the time, but I realized it pretty quickly that he was embattled in many ways. The structure of scientific revolutions had come out in the early 60s. It had been attacked by many, many, many people for many different reasons. The attacks had come from philosophers, particularly those concerned with scientific truth and knowledge. Kuhn's book was the first historical study of science that challenged the picture that scientific revolutions got us closer and closer to the truth. There's a really old argument in Western philosophy, from Sextus Empiricus, one of the ancients, that everyone is observing the world from their own perspective, and that things look different depending on different perspectives, and that there's no one perspective that tells you what the world is really like. There's just the world according to this or that perspective. Kuhn rehabilitated this ancient argument in the one area of human inquiry everyone thought had moved past this kind of skepticism. But whether due to the ongoing attacks from philosophers or other reasons, 
Kuhn simply refused to engage with his students in these questions. In fact, he refused to engage with them about his own theories. There were really two halves to the history and philosophy of science program at Princeton. Thinking about it now, it really kind of reflects the two halves of Thomas Kuhn. The half that I saw was the historian, and he was brilliant. His specialty was very close readings of classic scientific work. The other half was really the philosopher. This we rarely saw. There was never a mention of Popper, of even the word paradigm was, was almost never used. We were told pretty early on that we were not to try to use the structure of scientific revolutions as, as some kind of a blueprint. You just didn't do that. We never got along, really from the very beginnings of my stay there. And it got worse and worse and worse. Kuhn was dogmatic, inflexible, and abusive. I wouldn't say it was just to me. I would say it was to a number of people. But I think he was particularly abusive to me. Kuhn, first of all, could be pretty intimidating. He was tall, 6'2", maybe even 6'3", big broad shoulders, big neck, big hands, and a booming voice. Interactions with him could sometimes be standing there with him looking down at you and shouting. In seminars, he could be very intense, completely focused on the issue. You jolly well had to know your stuff, or you looked foolish. He also could be a little bit impatient. Oh, and I should also mention he was a chain smoker. Two or three times, he would put the chalk in his mouth and try to write on the blackboard with his cigarette. And so by the end of the seminar, you know, there was this kind of blue haze over the whole room. Of course, it was lung cancer that eventually killed him, and it's a wonder the rest of us are still alive. It depressed me. Uh, I think that, that I have a tendency to think of myself as stupid and incompetent. He would assault people. I think that's the correct way to describe it. And I pretty quickly developed a kind of contempt for him and his work. There's a term taken from the historian Herbert Butterfield, Whiggishness. The essence of it is that you look at the past through the lens of the present. Let's say, for the sake of argument, that you could somehow take away the prejudice of the present and look at the past with fresh eyes, the way someone who lived in it would have looked at it. This was the kind of thing that Kuhn specialized in, it, kind of his mantra. Trying to imagine what they were thinking as opposed to what we're thinking. The goal was to be able to get inside that particular scientist's head. And what that meant is you essentially went to school the way he did, you read the texts of the people that taught him, you read carefully everything that they wrote, you tried to see why that particular scientist described the world the way he did. I was taking at that time a seminar with him on 19th century electricity and magnetism. We were reading papers of essentially Maxwell, looking at Maxwell through the eyes of the late 19th century and not the present. Here's Errol's story. He wrote a paper about Maxwell, and Kuhn charged him with Whiggishness. In fact, in a 30-page double-spaced paper, Kuhn wrote a 30-page single-spaced response, charging Errol with Whiggishness. Errol went to Kuhn's office with a response. Remember that in Kuhn's own philosophical work, he was reviving this old skeptical argument in the context of science that there's no one perspective from which you can determine what things were really like. Who becomes, of course, the ultimate arbiter of what is Whiggish and what is not? He does. 
even though he has provided this skeptical thesis, presumably he's the person who can look through that skeptical thesis to some underlying reality without ever, ever acknowledging that what he was saying was inherently contradictory. He's trying to kill me. He's trying to kill me. He's trying to kill me. As Errol was making He's his case to, to Kuhn, He's trying that to Kuhn's view was contradictory, He's trying to kill me. He's trying Kuhn to buried his head in his hands, muttering to himself, He's trying to kill me. He's trying to kill me. Then, according to Errol, Kuhn picked up an ashtray full of cigarette butts and threw it at his head. Errol got kicked out of the program and went on to win an Oscar. I would describe it as bullshit. Uh, I see him as a fraud. And over the years, if anything, it's become stronger and stronger and stronger. I'm more convinced than ever that what I felt in 1971 or 1972 was right. I still feel it now, many, 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 many years later. I sometimes joke that Kuhn set back the whole profession of history and philosophy of science by at least 50 years. I started to think about, in some of my angrier moments, about politics left and right. And I often think at Princeton, while people were demonstrating against the IDA, there was Kuhn ensconced in his office at the Institute for Advanced Study, writing about how there is no such thing as truth. And I actually find it deeply repellent. Ultimately, I believe he just became involved in, you know, an elaborate process of lying, misrepresentation, evading, avoiding. It became, for me, despicable. Even today, when you talk about Kuhn, people will backtrack very, very quickly, and they will say, well, he said such and such, but he really didn't mean that, and if he really meant that, he revised it, and he changed it, blah, 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 blah. I don't believe he gave up any of these tenets, particularly the truly nonsensical tenets of structure. In my angrier moments, I see him as not entirely responsible for the debasement of science and the debasement of truth. Despicable, deeply repellent. I see a line from Kuhn to Karl Rove and Kellyanne Conway, and Donald Trump. You're listening to High Fi Nation, a show about philosophy that turns stories into ideas. I'm Barry Lamb. Errol Morris started making films a few years later, starting with The Gates of Heaven, a film about the pet burial business, which the late film critic Roger Ebert put on his list of top 10 films of all time, next to films like Citizen Kane, Casablanca, and Raging Bull. Errol's never stopped working since. I'm Tom Rankin. I teach documentary art at Duke University. I'm lucky enough this year to be around the corner from the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University, where they teach the theory, history, and production of documentaries in photography, film, and audio. I asked Tom Rankin about how to place Errol's work in the history of the genre. He mentioned cinema verite, French for truthful cinema, as the style of documentary filmmaking prominent during the time Errol starts his career. Two features of cinema verite are the lack of an omniscient narrator and the camera being very active in pursuing people and events, filming those events at the moment they're happening. Think the TV show Cops, or MTV's The Real World, as direct descendants of cinema verite. Film, because it is motion, uh, so often feels like it has to move fast. You know, not only does what's in the picture is moving fast, the car's racing fast, the horse is running fast, but then the camera's got to move fast, and the cuts have to be fast. 
I think of Errol Morris in the sweep of the of documentary film tradition. He's coming on the heels of of the sort of height of cinema verite, and yet slowing it down. It feels to me like it's really not trying to follow all the action. It is letting people's narrative and story bring the action. There's not a lot of complicated shots. There's not a lot of panning. There's really careful editing and pacing. It's it's more patient. It's more of a listening device. It's simple in the way that uh, Hemingway could write a sentence that only had six words, and yet it can do so much more than something so much more complex. A man reaches down and grabs a possum by the tail and pulls him back and drags him through the sand. He only moves about eight inches, and it's the most beautiful little gesture. You know, when this turkey hunter tells these amazing stories of the pursuit of the turkey, and you never see the turkey. So it's also about invisibility. Again, nothing happens, and yet everything happens. Well, we're here to put Caesar in the ground today. And uh, Cal, here's... Uh a little picture of Caesar here, and I think oh, if you see that, you can yes. understand why we wanted him buried in a good place like what Bubbling a, Wells here. You know, I feel like I know him. Is that, that right? That face, that smile. He was I quite feel... some dog. Uh, he was a uh, mixture of Australian sheep and terrier. And terrier? Yeah. Australian sheep? As you can sheep. see with all that hair he had. Did he have a coat? That That has been a huge contribution to the documentary mode, whether people realize it or not. This man will listen to anything, and over time, if you listen carefully enough, revelation happens. And there are these really pregnant silences that he just lets happen. And they're revelatory, ultimately. They get to a kind of truth, a kind of human truth and truth of the moment. And I think that that it's hard for any other filmmaker or interviewer to watch those films and not feel that. Talk is something he really responds to. It probably is a precursor to why he can then make a film where it's all an interview, or why he is so obsessed at times with these quests for for something. Sometimes to the point of maybe taking it a little too far. The Thin Blue Line, you know, even the number of reenactments and the beauty with which he shot them, the lighting, Tom Rankin is talking about the pioneering use of crime reenactments in The Thin Blue Line. Arrow used many reenactments in that film to reproduce the stories of various witnesses in a true crime whodunit documentary. The cinematography, camera angles, lighting, even the soundtracking from composer Philip Glass took its influence from film noir, a beauty and mood that is characteristic of fictional crime stories rather than documentary. Errol took a lot of criticism at the time from purists in the documentary tradition for this incorporation of production techniques from fictional film into non-fictional film. Why wasn't he just aiming to record events as they happened? Today, though, the use of reenactments is almost necessary in the whodunit true crime story. For example, my favorite episode of season one of Serial was when Sarah Koenig and Dana Chivas got into their car and reenacted the story of the murder as told by the prosecution in the Adnan Syed case. For me, nonfiction filmmaking raises all kinds of philosophical issues, very basic philosophical issues about our connection with the world, how we know things, what is real and what is not. Very, very early on, my career as a documentary filmmaker, people would criticize what I did because they said it really wasn't documentary, as if there was a prescribed set of rules that you should follow in making a documentary film, and that if you broke those rules, it was no longer documentary. It was apostasy of some kind. It was criticisms of even the films before The Thin Blue Line, but certainly in The Thin Blue Line there were criticisms of the use of of reenactment. Everything is a reenactment. Consciousness is a reenactment of the world inside of our skulls. And the task is how to get back to the world from that reenactment inside of our skulls. One of the things that fascinates me about history 
is we know that there is such a thing as history. We know there was a battle of Hastings. Can we ever get back to it? What if we lose evidence? What if all of the evidence vanishes? And so I started to think about what I call investigative realism. I refer to it as the everything bagel. You do everything. You do everything in your power to figure things out or to understand how things work. So there's drama. There's reenactment. There's archival. There's interviews. It's an investigation. It's an investigation into reality into what really is out there, what really happened. There's a very natural inclination to retreat from the external world when you start feeling the pressures of skepticism. If you ask what the thin blue line is about, it seems like one right answer is that it's about the murder of a police officer in Texas on a dark night. But that event wasn't ever recorded on film, nor did anyone on that night directly observe the whole truth of what happened. So the only evidence you have is from interviews, ballistic and forensic evidence, and models or reenactments you construct to recreate the perspectives of those involved. This ancient argument of Sextus Empiricus, that you don't know reality because you only have access to particular perspectives of it, and no perspective is special, there's a response to it that requires you to start retreating. You start saying things like, the film isn't about the murder. It's about people's memories of the murder. But then memories can be mistaken too, and people can lie. So the film then becomes only about people's reports about their memories about the event. But why stop there? Are you editing the film? And are your edits making it less truthful or more? And how do you know that? And so you keep retreating, and pretty soon, the film has to be about the filmmaker's own perceptions of people's reports about their memories about the event. The ultimate retreat is that the film loses reference to the real world. But there's another response to Sextus Empiricus. You don't retreat at all in the first place. The thin blue line just is about the murder of a Texas police officer. The different perspectives are perspectives about the same underlying reality. On this view, you keep the real world. You just eat the skepticism. Maybe it doesn't get at the real truth. So be it. It's still an attempt at it. This is Errol's investigative realism in contrast to what you might call anti-realism, where ultimately the film is about nothing more than the filmmaker's own thoughts and perspectives. I also see his interest in the visual panoply that film can be. I think he's a visual artist, and so the restlessness of the visual artist, you see it in the films when you look at them over time. The groundbreaking production technique that Errol Morris is most widely known for is the Interatron, a piece of technology where through the use of mirrors and lenses, Errol the interviewer can simultaneously film and make direct eye contact with the speaking subject through the camera lens. The subjects he interviews end up looking directly into the camera while talking to him. When we watch the film, the subject then appears to be speaking directly to us. It's disarming. There's a brilliance and a lesson and a, uh, a power to the fact that people are looking at the camera. But you do drift into this sense that you're just there when things are happening. It's all happening for Errol Morris. It's all happening for his camera. The Interatron shot in Errol Morris's work is a privileging of a first-person and second-person conversation. It's privileging the perspective of looking straight into the eye to find out a truth. Something about that shot works differently for us than observing an interview from a third-person perspective. The privileging of a certain perspective to identify uniquely certain truths only knowable from that perspective, that's another response to Sextus Empiricus. That's a kind of realism. 
his films are very meta in questioning the truth of film, even when he's questioning the truth of whatever story is being told on the film. We could look at his films just as a way to think about film and about where film gets us to a, a whole nother level of understanding of what went on and what we ought to think about what went on and how it also is impotent at some points. He is a filmmaker's filmmaker, and he's also a, an artist's artist. You're listening to High Fi Nation, a show about philosophy that turns stories into ideas. I'm Barry Lamb. Thomas Kuhn died in 1996. There's only so much we can know about his perspective from 1971. Once uh, got to know him, certainly in class. In fact, he was very personable. He had a wonderful sense of humor and a quick smile. And he would, he would tease me sometimes about being from North Dakota, and I would give it back about being in New Jersey. Starting in um, 1969, things on college campuses got pretty crazy, even Princeton. Apparently, there were a couple of graduate students that were uh, really outspokenly radical. There were a couple that were looking for a fight. There's no question about it. There were a couple that were just, you know, half a bubble off plum during uh, Kuhn's seminar on thermodynamics that one of the new students got into a tangle with him over the second law of thermodynamics, which this student thought was immoral and really should be stricken from any kind of a real just and democratic science. And, of course, Kuhn had no patience at all with that. In the early and mid-'70s, his own personal life was not happy. His marriage was breaking up. His final decision, really, to go up to MIT was prompted by his divorce. And he suddenly realized that most of his social friends had been his wife's friends. He's trying to kill me. So let me just tell you the ending to um, Errol Morris's story. Kuhn took his ashtray full of cigarette butts and threw it at his head. Is that completely out of character in your view? Is it plausible? Can you give me like your assessment of that event, judging from your experiences with Kuhn? I could imagine that happening. The provocation would have had to been pretty strong. More than once to to make a point, you know, he would slam his hand down on the table, you know, wham, and say, look, you've got to understand that Max Planck was blah, 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 whatever. So he could be very emphatic and physical. Obviously, I never saw him throw anything at, at anybody. Actually, well, what... <laughs> The, what tended to get thrown around in the seminar rooms were, were, were packs of cigarettes, but um, that was about it. What do you think about this particular episode, this era in your life? Because you've had a long and distinguished career. As, as many people as bought and has been influenced by Kuhn's book, that's probably you know a fraction of your total audience, right? What do you think it is about this period of life that, that you keep coming back to and thinking about? There's so many reasons. Part of it is the feeling of being abused, of being punished for something that I should never have been punished for. That's certainly part of it. And part of it is the issues still fascinate me deeply. We come now finally to the work of Thomas Kuhn. As an academic philosopher myself, I wouldn't describe Kuhn as a philosopher's philosopher. His influence on academic philosophy today is not nearly as heavy as his influence on the broader intellectual culture. Still, there are some Kuhn scholars out there who study and interpret his work today. I'm Lydia Patton. I'm an associate professor of philosophy at Virginia Tech. The first bumper sticker I ever had was when I was, I think I was 15 or 16, and it was subvert the dominant paradigm there's a reason why that's a bumper sticker, right? It's still a bumper sticker. It's still a popular one. And 
there's a kind of cool aspect to the paradigm shift idea because the idea is, hey, you know, like, why are people resisting my ideas? It's because they're conservative, stick in the mud, you know, uncool people who like are still back in this dated way of looking at things. And I am the genius who's going to overturn all the fundamental conceptual categories and going to innovate and disrupt and all those things, right? And, that, and I think that, you know, it was popular then, it's popular now. It's not really hard to see why. One of the reasons that Kuhn is considered to be so groundbreaking is precisely the destruction of the idea that science just makes this kind of uniform progress over time by accumulating results. One of the things that Kuhn said was just that if you look at the history of science, you can't explain the behavior of scientists that way. You can't explain how scientists work and how scientists do things in practice by looking at this accumulation picture. Instead, Kuhn offered a picture of scientists as operating under what he called paradigms. One of the most surprising things about structure, when we study this in my seminars or when we talk about it, is Kuhn actually defines a paradigm as a textbook. It's not a theory, it's a textbook. On Kuhn's view, someone great has a revolutionary achievement, and people take their work as the textbook way to learn about the world. The textbook gives you the rules of the game. It tells you what exists in the world. It tells you what to look for and how. It tells you what's important and what isn't. And then, everyone in science falls in line behind this new textbook, this new paradigm. If you are following in the footsteps of someone who has made a revolutionary scientific achievement, someone like Newton or Lavoisier, then you're doing normal science. What that means is the revolutionary scientific achievement sets the rules of the game. And it tells you implicitly how to follow those rules in order to solve problems and solve puzzles. Kuhn argued famously that this kind of puzzle solving was really the characteristic activity of most working scientists. And then something happens. At some point, experiments or certain conceptual puzzles or research or just abstract thought or life intervenes. <laughs> and it starts to become quite clear that the paradigm that you have doesn't account for everything that you can observe or for everything that you can think or for everything that you encounter. And that's called an anomaly, a practical glitch in the paradigm. When glitches happen, people don't just decide that they're going to give up the paradigm and find a new one. Instead, scientists are conservative. They see all of their own successes from their paradigm, and they think the glitch is just an outlier, worth ignoring. At the same time, there might be someone or a group who just doesn't buy into the original paradigm at all. And they devise a revolutionary new paradigm, a new textbook way to do science, which sets new rules of the game. This new set of rules can make sense of the anomalies. But to people in the old paradigm, this new paradigm just doesn't make sense. This new paradigm just doesn't follow the textbook rules of doing science. It's at this point that Kuhn's view becomes something philosophically controversial. Errol Morris. There was a claim in the middle of it that paradigms were essentially incommensurable. You can't compare one paradigm with another. You can't compare paradigm A with paradigm B. And you most certainly can't compare the reference of terms in paradigm A with the reference of terms in paradigm B. It's a very, very, when you stop and think about it, and I'm not sure how many people really did stop and think about it, it's a very radical idea. In Kuhn, it tells you that there really is no such thing as reference. There is no reference to an external reality, to an external world, because there is no external reality. There is no world beyond the paradigm. If there is any kind of reference whatsoever, it's just simply reference contingent on what paradigm you find yourself parked in at any given time. Incommensurability is a really interesting and complicated concept. You might become so steeped in that paradigm that you simply cannot understand what someone in another paradigm is doing 
without having it translated to you as if you were learning another language. The earlier Kuhn of structure presented incommensurability as a kind of practical impossibility. So imagine that, that there's someone who's an American and he's living in Morocco and he's living in a rented apartment and he wants to invite some friends to dinner. And he looks around the dining room of the rented apartment and he doesn't see any chairs. So he goes and talks to his landlord and his landlord says, there are seven chairs in the dining room. See, so the American looks around and says, oh, I thought those were cushions. <laughs> I, I understand now that you sit on those and those are chairs. And so now he can have his dinner party, right? Now imagine that you have someone, a scientist, who works on electromagnetism. And she accepts the fluid theory of electricity. So she thinks that electricity is a literal physical fluid like water. And she's working in that paradigm of fluid electricity. One day she wants to set up an experiment in her lab and she looks around for a battery. She looks around for something to generate a current. And what she thinks of as a battery is a Leiden jar, which is literally a glass jar filled with acid that create a current. She thinks that it's the fluid that's responsible for creating the current. And there are no Leiden jars there, but there's a pile of boxes filled with chemical paste that have metal contacts on them. And she says, well, I see those, but those are not batteries. Someone else walks in and says, look, those are dry cell batteries. Dry cell batteries work off of a chemical paste that generates the same kind of current. To her, there were no batteries there. So if she wants to use those dry cell batteries, if she wants to start setting up experiments, if she wants to start doing investigative research, she's going to have to actually change the way she thinks about working with electricity. She's going to have to change the way she thinks about batteries. So it's not just a matter of adopting a different tool. It's also a matter of changing her practical way of doing research. That kind of forced change to your background views is a result of incommensurability, which is a kind of way in which your former paradigm and a succeeding paradigm don't match up. This would be a paradigm shift, according to Kuhn. Kuhn said paradigm shifts arise because of incommensurability. You can't fit a belief that dry paste can generate electricity if your whole paradigm Everything you've ever done up to this point assumes that electricity has to be a fluid. You have to jettison the entire paradigm. When a revolution happens and people just switch paradigms, Kuhn didn't believe that the switch happens because people see better reason or evidence to switch paradigms. This is because what it means to be a good reason or to be good evidence depends on the paradigm itself. He also argued that there wasn't a privileged paradigm from which one can evaluate all the other paradigms. This just is the argument of Sextus Empiricus, applied to science. I would describe it as bullshit. People like Errol Morris and many other philosophers took Kuhn to be arguing that there is no truth beyond the paradigm in which a particular person is stuck. On this reading, a scientist is just a filmmaker making films about their own perspectives. The films never make reference to an external world. I could see how this view would be repellent. But there's another reading of Thomas Kuhn. One of the things that I really admire about Kuhn and about the Strong Program is their scholarship of the history of science. And they care deeply about getting that right. And I don't understand how, if you have read their work and if you have appreciated it in that way as deep, careful, interested history of science that gets the facts right and that cares about getting the facts right and getting the events right, that you could say that these are sort of radical relativists in the way that, that they're just saying that nothing is true and nothing can be proven and so forth, because they actually, they themselves make a number of falsifiable claims about the history of science. And those claims are backed up by impressive scholarship. Lydia Patton's view is that Kuhn wasn't trying to make a philosophical claim at all. Incommensurability was an historical claim. As a matter of historical fact, scientists couldn't compare their paradigms with each other. They couldn't overcome their own worldviews 
to see their predecessors, or their successors, on their own terms. It's actually a concession to Errol Morris in one way. Does that mean that we can make a necessary normative claim that it is impossible for a scientist trained in one paradigm to also be trained in the other paradigm? No, it's not impossible. Insofar as Kuhn ever said that, I think he was wrong. But it's not a concession to Errol Morris in another way. What is the way to overcome your own paradigm and to see other paradigms for what they are? The goal was to be able to get inside that particular scientist's head. Trying to imagine what they were thinking as opposed to what we're thinking. Who is in the best position to compare different paradigms? Presumably, he's the person who can look through that skeptical thesis to some underlying reality. And if there was one scholar in the past 100 years who seemed to do that best, who would it be? I want to ask one last question about Kunis. Looking back, what do you make of the man now? Asshole. <laughs> That's it? Yeah. Have some kind of sympathy of why he was being an asshole at the time? And... Not really, no. Because okay. you, you've made films about some major league assholes. I have. You might call me an <laughs> asshole connoisseur. Um, there's certain assholes I just don't like. The amount of ethical questions we can ask ourselves is overwhelming. But the thing is, everybody wrestles with questions about ethics. Some are easy to figure out. Should I murder someone? No, you shouldn't. But there are other questions that are more difficult to answer. I'm Andy Cullison, the host of Examining Ethics, director of the Prindle Institute for Ethics, and professor of philosophy. I'm Christian Weishart, a recovering art historian and stranger to the field of ethics. And I'm Sandra Burton, have no advanced degrees, but I did get an A- in Intro to Philosophy. We're an expert and two very non-experts wrestling our way through difficult ethical questions. But examining ethics isn't in the business of answering questions for you. We are in the business of giving our listeners an arsenal of tools. Tools that help answer the ethical questions we face all the time. Join us each month for discussions about many of the ethical questions, large and small, that we face in our everyday lives. You can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Find us at examiningethics.org. Expert or not, we'll give you something to wrestle with. Visit HiFiNation.org for a complete reading list and soundtrack for this episode. This episode of Hi-Fi Nation was produced, written, and edited by Barry Lamb. Production assistance from Shanna Andraus. Support for this episode was made possible by the Humanities Writ Large Fellowship at Duke University. Visit us at HiFiNation.org. That's H-I-P-H-I Nation.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. <laughs>